Yeah. So, Bill, how is the weather in your world? Oh, it's very pleasant today yeah. and uh, kind of nice. Uh, uh, very much the same weather as Detroit has. So we're, we're more or less on the same latitude mm -hmm. here. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's very nice. As you can probably tell from camera, I got the world's worst haircut a week ago. Just awful, awful, awful haircut. <laughs> and I don't know. Sorry. Uh, uh, was it professionally done or yeah, occasion yeah, occasionally it, done? It, it wasn't my usual person, though. We had a little bit of an issue about mask compliance there the last time I was there. And, uh, you know, they were not having many people wear their masks, even though they had promised that they were at the, you know, the normal place that I go. So I, uh, you know, withstood it all at that point. But then I called him and said, hey, I'm a little pissed about this. And, uh, you know, are you going to change your policy about this or anything? And they said, well, you know, we're not going to tell our customers what they should or shouldn't do. And I'm like, what? You know, OK. So got a business then when we're all, you know, huddled in our homes because we're not even able to leave now because you don't want you know, yeah. to ask someone to put a mask on, you know, um, anyway, you know, so I went somewhere else and got the world's worst haircut. <laughs> it looks fine. <laughs> okay, Katie, I think we're ready. <clears throat> This is Autoline After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 525 for September 17th of 2020. When internal combustion is not enough, ZF adds electric. Watch Autoline After Hours live at Autoline.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Hey, Gary. How you doing, John? Doing pretty good. You know, it occurred to me that when we started doing this, the way we're doing these shows now, there was snow on the ground. And I, I have a suspicion that we're like on the, on the edge of autumn already. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. No, there'll be snow on the ground and gone before <laughs> we're back in the studio again. Oh, let's, let's, let's hope it's quicker than that. Yeah. So, all right. What happened today in 1943? You're not going to guess. September 17th, 1943. No, nah, I'm not going to guess. What is it? So Daimler Benz introduced. So, so, so Katie, bring the picture up. Daimler Benz introduced a wood oh, gas I generator. I, I was going to say, the, I know what that is. The 170 V passenger car. So it, it added 70 kilograms of weight. And with one. 24 kilogram load of charcoal it added from 100 to 130 kilometers of range so so here we have an early supplemental uh, system for a uh, vehicle that i think uh is, is sort of in keeping with the theme of today's show yeah <laughs> that's right that car literally ran on hydrocarbons and I dare say that you could have taken a pipe from the end of the tailpipe and put it around it all the way to the carburetor and keep that thing going. So it would be the the um, eternal inter, um, perpetual the motion perpetual machine. motion machine. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, who knew? It wouldn't be totally perpetual. You'd have to add a little more charcoal every now and then. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we got to let Bill Viznik join us. Bill, where are you? There you are. Hi, John. Hi, Gary. How you doing? Yeah. I'm good fine. to have you. Fine. Good. Thanks How's for everything going me. at SAE International? Uh, it's going. I think just like with everybody else, we're all uh, sort of adapting and trying to determine, uh, you know, what an engineering organization needs to be doing and how we need to be doing it, uh, you know, while business still proceeds day after day for the, for the car industry. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Well, good to have you on the show with us. And it's perfect with your engineering background there from SAE because and let's bring in our special guest for the day, Jorg Trompler from ZF. Hello out there, Jorg. Hi, John. Hey, Gary, Bill. How are you doing? Hi, Jorg. I'm good. Thank you. So so before the show started, Jorg saw that picture and he he immediately knew what it was as well. <laughs> I, although I have to admit, I'm a bit embarrassed. I mean, it's a Daimler vehicle, and I wasn't aware Daimler did this in the 1940s. So, but I think it's cool technology. <laughs> yeah, York, I, I'll tell you the background. I mean, of course, this is in the middle of World War II. Petrol was very difficult to come by, but mm -hmm. there was plenty of coal and charcoal lay, laying around. And, and that's why these modifications were made to these vehicles. Mercedes was not the only one, and it was not just in Germany. This was done uh, in many different countries in Europe at the time. Never caught on for obvious reasons. It was only an emergency measure. Can you imagine the emissions? <laughs> I've seen motorcycles converted too to uh, do the same thing. Oh, that's wild. Where the weight right, so, really helped a lot. <laughs> so so, so let's, let's bring it up to the 21st century. Um, York, tell us, tell us a little bit about ZF for the members of the audience who are not familiar with the company and what it is that you do at ZF. So ZF or ZF in, in this country, I mean, we are very flexible with that. So we are a tier one automotive supplier with a broad range of products. But I think in, in this country, we're, we're, we're very well known for our transmissions, but there are also shock absorbers, axle drive systems, the entire ADAS technology. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in the powertrain area. So I'm, I'm heading our North American engineering team with the focus on, on transmissions, transmission components. So York didn't, I mean, ZF's been around forever, right? And tell me if I'm wrong. I, I, didn't you guys make the engines for the Zeppelins in Germany back in the 1920s or even before that? It, it was, I mean, I think ZF was founded in the, even at the end of the 19th century. So 1890 something. And uh, yes, there was, I mean, definitely the, the, the Zeppelin technology. I don't know all the details, so I have to say I never went that back far in, in the history. But that's basically where we're coming from, yes, the ZF Friedrichshafen, and the Zeppelin technology. Uh -huh. So um, you, were, you were saying transmissions, and when we think about transmissions, we basically think of, you know, automatic step gear transmissions. But you guys are, are taking it somewhat further rather than... Um, what many people are familiar with, um, and and actually integrating electric motors. Tell tell us about what you guys are up to. So we have, I mean, when we look at, at our current portfolio, it's the eight speed transmission that uh, let me say so it made it across the Atlantic Ocean somewhere in in 2012 or so. That's when we uh, built our transmission plant in Greycourt, South Carolina, and then when we got into business with with FCA. Uh, at that time, it, it was a purely conventional automatic transmission, so for ICE, the powertrains only. Uh, but then we started, uh, let me call it, electrifying the transmission. So today we have uh, our base transmission and we have a hybrid transmission that has an integrated electric motor. So basically what we are what we're doing, and I think uh, you have a picture available somewhere, if you could just pull this up. That, okay, it doesn't matter. It's, oh, thank you. So you see, this is this is our eight-speed transmission. And, and one of the significant changes is where people usually expect the torque converter on, on the left side. That's where the transmission is being mounted to the engine. There is, there is no longer a torque converter. It's being replaced by an electric motor. And uh, thank you. We, I think we can go back to, to the screen. So that's one of the key things, and it's part of our strategy, say, Let's keep the overall transmission length where it is with the torque converter, take the torque converter out, replace it by an electric motor and a torsional damper is in there too, so that um, we can create a hybrid transmission. Basically, what, what you can do is you have the electric motor and uh, that allows vehicles, let's say, if we just have conventional hybrid, it allows the typical hybrid operations like, like boosting, maybe some electric launch and then handing over to the internal combustion engine. But also, and that's what we're focusing in on nowadays, is the plug-in hybrid, where we want to enable pure electric driving in a vehicle that has an internal combustion engine. And, and the key thing for us, 
because you can imagine having uh, a transmission production facilities and capacity, that's not cheap. I mean, you want to utilize that. And in times like these, where we see the market is changing, the directions are a little bit uncertain, we want to have flexibility. We cannot say, oh, we want to continue forever with conventional transmissions or, oh no, we're changing completely and do only hybrid transmissions. That's why we have our modular approach and say, we want to allow our customers to drop this transmission into their vehicle without changing the vehicle significantly. I mean, obviously they have to add electric infrastructure, no question about that. Mm -hmm but the overall length of the transmission and the dimensions stay the same. How is that accomplished? I mean, is it because the torque converter goes and you use that space? First of all, I mean, because we have so many smart people on board, I have <laughs> to say that. Yeah. No, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, uh, yes, the torque converter goes and then the electric motor is dropped in and there are some, some other changes and, uh, but basically, we have to overcome some challenges of the missing torque converter because, you know, especially in, in this country, the torque converter is the, let's say, preferred launch element. I mean, we know these com comparisons, the discussions about DCTs with dry clutches versus torque converter launch and so on. So all of a sudden you don't have this smooth launch element anymore. Instead, we have a one of the internal clutches of the transmission, the B clutch is being reinforced is being used as the launch clutch for the transmission. So it's a wet clutch, so that's a good thing, but still it's not as smooth as the torque converter. And that's where um, our calibration engineers come in and have to really work with the software uh, to make uh, vehicles launch smoothly and also shift smoothly. So you must use the electric motor to make up for the lack of a torque converter. That's, yeah, yeah, okay, good point. You, you do not have the torque multiplication that the torque converter brings. So that's where the uh, electric motor comes in also for, for launching the vehicle, producing or adding the extra torque, the torque multiplication. And of course, we just learned today, officially at least, that this is the transmission that Jeep is going to use in the plug-in version of the Wrangler. And I've got to imagine it's probably going to go in a whole lot more other Jeep and FCA models. You know, I cannot speak to that. I mean, <laughs> to the second part of your sense, but I can confirm, yes, it's the transmission for the Jeep Wrangler. And I'd have to tell you that the team was pretty excited when uh, we knew that we got, we were awarded this business for the hybrid application of the Wrangler, because I mean, the Wrangler is an iconic vehicle, period. That's the thing. And it's the, I don't want to say it's the first off-road application for us because we have uh, eight-speed transmissions also in, in Range Rovers, but it is a different level. I mean, that's that's what my team is telling me too. In, in terms of um, off-road capability requirements, it is a different level. And they had to work really hard on, on meeting all the requirements from FCA to make this a um, off-road capable plug-in hybrid uh, vehicle. Well, that was one of my questions, Jorg, is uh, when you get into four-wheel drive applications, uh, and in particular, ones like the Wrangler, which is a really a selectable four-wheel drive, so it's not automatic, does that really complicate the job of now using an electrified uh, automatic transmission in that vehicle? It, it, it seems to me it would be more complicated. So the, the four-wheel drive capability, that's not so much more complicated. It's it's more like, um, again, having a vehicle with tough off-road requirements, not having the torque converter in the transmission anymore. Mm. Because you can imagine, I mean, when you're launching the vehicle up a steep hill or want to climb over an obstacle, the torque multiplication is, comes in handy. Mm. And now we have an electric motor, which definitely helps. How, however, there is a but with that. Um, we all know um, you get instant torque from the electric motor. That's the thing. No engine revving up, it's there. But there's also a, a flip side to that. Um, when, when you have zero RPM in the electric motor and you launch it, you get to very high, <clears throat> very high currents, very immediate, very mm -hmm. quickly, and you want to avoid that. So that's also one thing where we had to work on and uh, overcome that. So that's more an issue thermal challenges and don't get me wrong i mean it's not that the vehicle is not capable it's just these extra challenges that came up and that made it really exciting mm -hmm. is is 
the application of your transmission only in plug-in hybrids or can you have them in non-plug-in hybrids as well? You can have them in, in non-plug-in hybrids too because at the end of the day, the transmission doesn't really care whether you have uh, a charger on board somewhere. Uh, it's just uh, with a plug-in hybrid, you can get a more powerful motor, e-motor into the transmission because you have uh, the bigger battery. So that's the thing. So we have, for example, in order to demonstrate that we built up a demo vehicle in Germany, it's it's a BMW 3 Series hybrid. But what our team did, we replaced the battery. So I think we, we put in a battery in there with three times the capacity of the original BMW capa uh, uh, capacity in order to prove, look, with plug-in hybrids, you can uh, achieve, if you achieve a range of let's say 60 to 70, 60 miles, you can basically cover most of the daily commute with that, basically drive emission free, or, or, or as people say, locally emission free. And when it really comes to long distance driving, you use the internal combustion engine. So, is but the technology in the transmission, sorry, technology in the transmission is the same, whether we say it's a plug-in hybrid or it's a just mm -hmm. a half. But but is there a minimum, Jorg, that, you know, you sort of say, here's what our minimum, uh, you know, motor output could be to make it worth putting into the transmission as opposed to somewhere else in the drive line? I mean, the, the Jeep 4X also has a motor generator at the front of the uh, uh, the engine crankshaft as well. Yeah. So uh, I, I have to imagine at some point there's a, you know, sort of a minimum that you say, uh, you know, the motor has to be a certain degree of output there to even make it worthwhile to integrate it into the transmission. Yeah, and, and I have to remember what's actually the, what the smallest um, e-motor is for our current uh, transmission yeah. lineup. I always remember the top, and that's right now around 100 kilowatts. And uh, in our next generation, we will go up to 150, 160 match, uh, max electric mm -hmm. power. Because I... I if, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, but, go ahead. but if you look at the at the other, other spectrum, the um, the mild hybrids, 48 volt mild hybrids, mm. I think they top out at around 25 kilowatts or so, mm. right. and that's not really sufficient for driving vehicles. You can maybe do some maneuvering, parking lot maneuvers. Uh, yeah, but uh, sorry, I am not aware really what what's the smallest mm. engine size for our transmission right now. Well, the the reason I ask is because I think you know, and and maybe John and Gary would agree with this, but some of the first generation really of uh, mild hybrids, you know, that we've had here in production, you know, that you've been able to buy, I, you know, I've found have been fairly unsatisfying in the fact that they don't really do much for you, you know, in terms of, you know, boosting your performance or uh, providing true all electric operation because the overall system really isn't bringing in that much more electric augmentation into the overall, uh, 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 you know, power output of the propulsion system. So we've had a lot of mild hybrids that, oh yeah, you know, up to three miles per hour, you know, you can run on electric and, oh, it recovers, you know, recuperates some energy when you're, you know, when you're braking and that kind of thing. But they have not really been sufficient for propelling the vehicle in any really sort of significant way, I think. So this, you know, this now, this new generation, I think is the one that is going to be key to maybe showing and demonstrating to people that, oh, electrification along with an internal combustion engine, there is a, a, a good sort of advantage, you know, that, that you can get from that because the, the early mild hybrids haven't, you know, for the most part, done much for if in the consumer mindset, at least anyway. I mean, it's it's interesting you bring that, that up. I think in, in software development, they always talk about killer applications. So that's basically the right. one application <laughs> that finally brings the breakthrough. On, on the mild hybrid side, I think you, you can see it on the emissions. I mean, emission reductions. I mean, mm -hmm. the numbers that we know are, for example, a, a C-segment vehicle with a mild hybrid system can um, reduce your, your CO2 output by about, I think, 10 to 20 grams per 100 kilometers. So that's a WLTP. Mm. Consumers don't feel that. They don't see that. It's, that's that's the point. But once you get into the high voltage um, 
uh, hybridization, and especially with the plugins and the bigger battery capacity, yes, you can maybe drive to work with your vehicle and don't even uh, see the combustion engine kicking in. You get the boost function. That's something. Regen or recuperation. Yeah, that's something. I mean, it's it's nice, but I, I'm not sure if consumers really see the benefit. Unless you go into one pedal driving. I mean, that's what you have in the EVs. I personally right, think that's right. a cool feature. Hmm. But but I agree, it's the high voltage. And with that, I would say it's advancement in battery technology. And with that, cost for batteries coming down, which allow that to put uh, more powerful hmm. e-motors into the vehicles. So let me ask you, your, your company um, is going to be taking the car powertrain technology and e-mobility divisions and putting them together. And this is going to be happening on uh, January 1st of, of next year. Um, why are you guys doing this and, and what does this portend in terms of technology developments? So when we look and uh, I mean, we have some presentations out there where we basically show that we, we have a dual approach. We have our conventional slash hybrid transmission, so the automatic transmissions, and have them electrified. That's the powertrain division. And then we have our e-mobility division and uh, where we develop electric motors and electric axle drives, amongst other products, but that's in terms of propulsion. So the, for example, the electric, electric axle drive uh, is in production for Mercedes-Benz uh, EQC. So, and you can see there, there's a lot of shared know-how, but also shared components. I mean, maybe not 100% identical components, but electric motors, you find electric motors in both worlds, power inverters, or power electronics on both sides. That's, that's one thing. Plus, I mean, we see the market moving towards electrification. We, we say hybrid, hybridization is a transitional technology. It, it will not be there forever. Maybe we will have niche applications 20 years from now, but probably not. So that's why we're moving that together in order to use our synergies better, but also to be able to be more flexible with the development resources. Jorg, uh, a couple of years ago, I was at a ZF sort of technology day showing off all different kinds of things. And I got the chance to drive a, a Ford F-150 pickup truck with four wheel steering. Yeah. It was fantastic. I mean, it, it gave this big mm -hmm. pickup, the turning radius of a, a small compact car. Uh, I know others have looked at this. Delphi, in fact, had it in the market about 20 years ago. I know American Axle has developed a system and the like. Where's that stand? It, it, are we ever going to see four wheel steering in, in full size pickups and SUVs? To be honest, I don't. I mean, I, I remember that event, and it, it was cool. I mean, you almost uh, get sick, get sick in that vehicle because there's all of a sudden a completely different motion. And and we had a we had another demo vehicle also. It was a Cadillac CT6 with uh, that. Um, I know we are we are in acquisition mode. I I don't know. I cannot speak to the rest of that. So we might see it one day, but that's all I can say. Okay. But I think it's cool technology. It is. Um, what has the effect of the pandemic been on the development of your, your world? So it's, um, it was interesting and it is still interesting. Let's say that's not a surprise for everyone. I think we, we, we went through the same cycle like all the others. So we had uh, plant shutdowns in, in April and I think a little bit in May. And unfortunately, our production plants are coming back, which is very important. I mean, you know, that's where the revenue comes in. In terms of development projects, uh, we've continued working on it. I mean, we have a little bit of short time work in Germany, but in the US, we've been working through. I've, I, my team, the, almost all of my team has been working from home since uh, the beginning of April. Um, and it's, I mean, we're moving along with our projects. There's no, no cancellation, nothing. And it's interesting. It's, I mean, we talked about it in the beginning, sitting at our homes here and, and discussing that. It's unbelievable that it's so many months ago and everything is working. You know, speak, speaking of Germany, so 
the requirements for things like emissions in the EU are different than they are here. And then there is another difference in China. Um, how does a company like yours, which is dealing in all of these, you know, three major markets dealing with them? It is, I mean, I would say it's kind of easy because you, when you look at the automotive world, I think we are we're talking global vehicle platforms. Yes, there are segments that are more popular in, in, in one area of the world. And uh, in Europe, you don't see half ton pickup trucks, maybe a handful. <laughs> The Chinese seem to be discovering the, discovering the vehicles <laughs> right now. It's very interesting. Yeah. But at the end, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of the day, we are developing for global vehicle platforms anyway, and we have to have this flexibility. And, and that gets me back to the modular approach for our automatic transmission, and also for the upcoming fourth generation, where we say we have to be able to use as many common components as possible whether there's a torque converter or an electric motor in the front. That's how we're dealing with it. And also in terms of production footprint. Jörg, you Jörg. mentioned, uh, oh, sorry, John, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jörg, one of the things that's so hot right now in the industry is electric pickup trucks. And there's some interesting propulsion things that are coming from that. I know you saw the, the video that Rivian put out where the wheels on the left-hand side can turn in one direction, yeah, the wheels yeah, yeah. on the right-hand side can turn in the other, and and that thing can just spin around in in its own wheelbase. Uh, and then uh, General Motors just showed uh, how the the Hummer EV with four-wheel steering will be able to move sideways. Mm -hmm. And then we see uh, uh, Lordstown Motors saying it it's going right to hub motors. Is, is ZF playing and all that? Are you looking at all these different ways of being able to move these pickups around? So with, with our electric drive units that we're developing, it doesn't really matter whether we put it in a pickup truck or a, a sedan or any other vehicle. Um, in terms of hub motors, I cannot comment on that right now. But I mean, what's, what's public knowledge is that uh, we're developing a two-speed transmission for our electric drive units and we have a demo vehicle out there. So that's basically our take on it right now. Say, how can we squeeze a little bit more efficiency out of the electric drive unit? Because efficiency here, and I, I think we, we achieve about 5%. That's something we can achieve compared to a single speed electric drive unit because efficiency there automatically translates into whatever you want to do, a reduced battery capacity with that reduced weight and reduced cost in the vehicle. And do, do most, oh, so do, be, do, you know, when you're talking about this, this two speed versus a one speed. So, so most EVs right now have a one speed transmission. Is that correct? The, the, the only vehicle I'm aware of, I don't know everything, but I'm aware of is the Porsche Taycan that has a two speed transmission. And the others, I, I, I'm not aware of any other vehicle that has a, has a multi-speed transmission in combination with electric drive. So, so what's, I mean, so why go to the two-speed? I mean, if it seems that everybody is satisfied with one. Um, there, there are two, two different things you, you, can, you can accomplish with that. And I mean, you know, Germany is the country of the Autobahn and uh, <laughs> the non-existing speed limit, at least in certain areas. <laughs> So, so basically, that's that's one thing. If you want to go to higher speeds, that transmission helps you while still operating the electric motor in a certain RPM range. The other thing is, I mean, towing capacity, obviously, that can be achieved. But also another uh, significant point, people not often look at that, is um, we can develop the electric motors differently if we say our two-speed transmission allows us to mm -hmm. operate the electric motor in a certain RPM range, in a smaller RPM range uh, compared to a single speed, we can develop the motors so that they can be more efficient in that RPM range. And that's where we squeeze out another percentage point or two. Mm -hmm. so, where, where has most of your uh, uh, electric motor expertise come from? Was that all internal uh, development or did you make acquisitions to to bring in some of the specialized uh, kind of knowledge that you need now to work specifically with electric motors? It is it is internal knowledge and it's basically it goes back oh, a long time and that's I mean 
those areas have been through, let's say, very cyclical times. I think the first, let me call it electrical product, electric product that we launched was a crankshaft starter generator for, for Mercedes-Benz, mm -hmm. 42 volts at that time. Must have been the 2007, 8, 6 time frame or so. And you know where that technology went. So, <laughs> right. so but okay. since then, I mean, we've continuously developing and then got into the high voltage hybridization and uh, yes, and the electric vehicle drives. Mm -hmm. Real good. Look, uh, we come to the end of the first segment of the show. Uh, Jorg, I want to thank you for coming on and bringing us up to speed with the different things that ZF is working on. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And uh, Anytime again. Good to see Thanks, you. Jared. Appreciate Thanks. it. Mm -hmm. Real good. We're going to take a quick commercial break right now. A shout out to our good friends at Borg Warner. The world is changing at an ever increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. All right, we're back talking all things automotive. John, Gary, and Bill. So, John, um, last week's show, we touched a little bit about the controversy between Nikola and uh, the Hindenburg Research Organization. Um, things have pretty much blown up since then. W what's going on? <laughs> well, you know, I reached out to Steve Gursky to see if I could get some sort of comment from him because he led the, the reverse merger that got Nikola all its money. Have not heard peep from, from Steve. But I'm sure his lawyer told him, don't you dare talk to the media at all. Don't say a word. But, you know, we saw Mary Barra uh, in a, a presentation to uh, investors say they're they're still sticking with the deal. I, I, I talked with uh, Bosch. Bosch is still sticking with the deal. So, look, I'm not going to try to defend Trevor Milton, except to say, I don't believe he's a flim flam man that was out to fleece investors. I believe he is an entrepreneur doing and saying whatever it takes to get his company launched. So since last week's show, now the Department of Justice has opened an investigation. That's a pretty serious development. But let's see what the DOJ and the Securities and Exchange Commission decide. I'm sure it's going to take several months, if not longer, before they, they come with any anything out of it. But it, I, again, my whole feeling is that, like any entrepreneur, I mean, look at all the stuff Elon Musk has said over the years that were way out there, missed all kinds of deadlines and dates and things like that. But as I keep pointing out, as long as entrepreneurs ultimately deliver something close to what they were promising... All their earlier antics are are forgiven. Bill, what do you think? Well, those kind of cases, first of all, you know, if it, if it becomes a thing that's about, uh, you know, stock or valuation manipulation, those kind of things, they're notoriously difficult to prove, first of all. You know, the, you've seen this happen in this business before, and it's happening almost every day now with startups, right? You know, technology startups, not just in automotive, but everywhere as you start to get all these creative ways to, to, like John said, kind of keep, get the company launched. Right. And, you know, you can make a lot of statements that I think back in the day, you know, really back in the conservative days of, of the markets, you know, and all that. Yeah. They might've been looked at as sort of misleading perhaps, you know, but, you know, I mean, the, you know, at the end of the day, I think you, you look at it and say, nobody twisted anybody's arm here in this deal, right? You know, I, I think GM went into it with its eyes open. Uh, it, you know, Bosch, uh, you know, everybody who's connected, uh, you know, these are all big boys. You know, they, they know what's, you know, how to conduct business. And, you know, I, I think if it turns out that somebody meaningfully and, and, and substantially lied somewhere, Okay, maybe, you know, maybe that goes somewhere. But apart from that, I think this is more or less what John said. Look, here's a guy who's trying to get a company started. 
there may or may not be something of real substance there. You know, who's to say? But that's one of the uh, the risks of the market, I think, as you as they say, right? You know, Terry, what are you your think thoughts? Well, the, my okay. So I will, as as I've always thought about the General Motors deal, that General Motors is doing it purely so they have a brand that is a different brand than GMC or Chevrolet to have an electric pickup truck. This works perfectly well for them because John, as you've mentioned, the battery factory that they are operating with uh, LG Chem or will be operating in with LG Chem in, in Ohio has got huge capacity. What, 300,000 vehicles could Yeah, 350 have. to 400 is my estimation. All right. So, so General Motors comes out with the Silverado EV, but it has a whole bunch of badgers that it's putting its batteries in. Um, this week, General Motors introduced its various drive motors and, and again, Altium drive motors. So it has a place it can put this technology, which then brings me back to this question of, okay, so what is it that Nikola is bringing to the party? I mean, um, if, if General Motors is doing the powertrain, um, they don't have a, Nikola does not have a stamping plant right now that I'm aware of. They don't have an assembly line right now that I'm aware of. And, oh, guess what? General Motors has both of those things right now that I am aware of, right? So so, so General Motors, now, if, if the brand Nikola becomes tarnished, that is an issue. But then when we get to the, to, to the whole question of that, you know, that Hindenburg report, is it, you know, going chapter and verse? You know, my question is, is what technology did that company develop? What technology does that company have that it can basically say, oh, here it is? And, well, and they, I, they were working the hydrogen fuel cell side as well. Uh, right. You know, if you remember. So there, uh, you know, there may be something there and maybe not. You know, this, this has kind of quickly sort of just sort of veered into straight on electric vehicle stuff. Uh, you know, but but Nikola really was start. You know, in, initially anyway, was talking about using a hydrogen fuel cell system. You know, in in big rigs. You know, over the road tractor trailers to uh, you know basically be an emissions free means of transportation. You know, uh, and then the Badger and all that sort of quasi you know semi commercial kind of applications. You know, uh, that 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 came afterwards kind of, you know, and now it's kind of really spun its way much more over into that conversation than what Nikola originally started as, which, hey, we want to put fuel cells in, you know, over the road trucks. So that's that's the part that always gives me a little bit of a red flag when, you know, here's what we started as, but here's what we now are talking about, you know, and, and I, I don't know. So, well, when we had Trevor on the show, he did say that there, that, um, for yeah. fewer than 300 miles, it's electric. For greater than 300 miles, it's hydrogen. And that he was going to be building out a network of, of hydrogen refueling stations and that uh, um, companies that would be buying their hydrogen trucks would basically, but be, what was it? How is John? It's like a, a contract that you buy that they, it's a service contract, mm -hmm. more or less. They give you the hydrogen, they fix your truck, they do the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. That to me, that's the real innovation that Trevor's brought to the party, so to speak. He's creating a subscription service for semi trucks, and if you're, I'll use a real world example, Anheuser Busch, the the beer brewer, they signed up for an order for eight hundred right. trucks. Why? Because they don't want to manage a truck fleet. They don't want to have to. Uh, you know, do all the service and the roadside service and pay for all the fuel and all that. They don't want any of that. So what Trevor says is, look, I'll give you the truck. You get the driver. You pay me 93 cents for every mile that you drive. And that includes everything. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if it includes insurance, but it includes all the maintenance, the payments on the truck, and importantly, the fuel. The fuel, all right. So th that's that's his real, I, I think, innovation. He he does have some intellectual property. They, they released that. This week or last, they, they, they've got access to some cathode and anode, this and that and the other thing for for batteries. And they, they probably have some intellectual property vis-a-vis -vis fuel cells. But here's General Motors saying, hey, 
You give us $2 billion, we'll give you everything that you need. Right, right. So he doesn't have to shell out anything for a factory or, a, a, you know, an assembly plant or anything like that. So I mentioned LG Chem earlier, and um, LG Chem announced that it is going to be spinning off its, you know, which I, I never realized it's a petrochemical company. I mean, uh, you know, we, we talk about LG Chem all the time as a battery company, but their their core business is in petrochemicals, um, that they're going to be spinning off the battery part of the business. Um are we going to see things like this more and more? I mean, and it gets back to this whole thing of um, when there was the speculation that GM might be spinning off its EV portfolio. Um, what do you guys see happening there? Well, look, I, I mean, I think you have to be careful. You know, we're still sort of in a, you know, a very competitive, I think, stage with battery technology, right? You know, and what you've got ready to go into vehicles right now. You know, there could be some pretty meaningful, you know, differences on that spectrum between an LG chem and say, a, you know, somebody else who's, who's you know, got a totally sort of different chemistry, even though the chemistries really aren't all that much different at this point, but maybe they've got a different form factor, you know, whatever. So we're still a little early, I think, in the development, you know, stage of batteries that, that you've got some meaningful differences there. I think when it's going to really become one of these things where you separate the wheat from the chaff, to be honest, is when you get to the point where, you know, the, all we're really trying to do is make batteries commodities now, exactly like brake discs or something, you know, and, and <laughs> nobody really wants to know much about it anymore other than how much is your battery, right? You know, and, you know, of course, what's the energy density, which is really the, the primary kind of, you know, metric about, you know, batteries for propulsion systems. Anyway, once you get to that point, you know, who knows that you could whittle this down to maybe two or three or four global players, I think, and that's it, you know. So I, I think a lot of companies are trying to test the waters for where do we fit into this, you know, sort of scenario right now that we're not even sure what the what the scenario is because it's still so early in the game. Yeah, um, yeah. Here, here's my take on it. What LG is doing, the investment community, the world over has shown it doesn't care about the traditional auto industry. It has no interest in investing there. I mean, I, I'm over exaggerating in the sense that, of course, people are buying and trading traditional car company stocks, but nobody sees any growth in that. And so how do you, as a traditional car company, unlock the value of your company and, and really let the new stuff that's growing fast achieve it, it, its own investment. So LG Chem wants to spin off its battery operations as a standalone company. I'll bet the stock goes through the roof. I mean, it, it's one of the largest, most capable battery makers in the world. Batteries are red hot right now. Uh, that's what this move is all about, is, is trying to unlock value and make a killing in the stock market. Yeah, the, the company basically... Um is this year is going to make 13 trillion won this is the korean won which which is we're we're talking here about uh 11 and change billion um dollars and they expect that as a result of this spin that by uh 2024 they'll be at 25.5 billion dollars so so roughly you know doubling where they are right now. Now, my question is, is this doubling a consequence of the valuation of the company going up or is it going to be, you know, pure revenue play that there are going to be more EVs mm -hmm. on the road, which sort of segues into the issue of Hyundai and Kia seem to be really pushing a lot of chips towards the EV uh, portion of, of their businesses. Um, with, with Kia announcing this week that uh, they're going to have seven pure EVs um, by, by 2027. And, you know, they're, they're looking at um, just, just having 25% of their global sales being electric vehicles by 2029. Um, is this, is this a realistic sort of thing um, that, 
they're speculating? It's speculating, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You know, they, uh, who knows? I, I mean, how, who's to say? Uh, you know, we've all seen the, you know, we've all seen the projections and, and you know, everybody's got their own uh, uh, timeline, you know, for, for when the, you turn the corner and you're, you know, you're really into serious EV you know, production and sales and, and everything. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think it's a, it, you know, incredibly multifaceted and complex dynamic, you know, that's involved with getting, you know, you, you even get it down to regions, you know, Asia may uptake electric much more quickly than, than we do. You know, Europe, I think has already shown that there's a certain predilection there to go uh, electric pretty quick. Uh, you know, Volkswagen's, shown everybody its latest, you know, first mass production EV just recently. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's, it, it, you know, there are a lot of, you know, variables, I guess. But, you know, I don't think it's a losing proposition to necessarily be out there saying right now, yeah, we've got, you know, 8,000 EVs on the drawing board here. You know, it's, it's you know, it probably sounds pretty good to just about everybody. Yeah, 25% is a very ambitious goal by 2030. As a means of comparison, Honda's goal globally at that time is 15%, you know, a full 10 percentage mm -hmm. points below where, where Hyundai and Kia are targeting to go. But, you know, 10 years out, who knows? Nobody knows. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to put their best estimates as to what's going to happen, but you know, we're just going to have to wait and see because nobody's got any certainty what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow for sure. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting is, is that I was looking into this and I think that part of the reason why we're seeing Hyundai Kia being so aggressive in terms of electrification is that um, South Korea plans to ban the internal combustion right. engine, new registration of internal combustion engine vehicles by 2035. Okay. So, so here are you know companies that are based there saying, hey, this is the way things are going. And then plus the South Korean government is um, providing funds for the development of electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles saying, you know, okay, this is what the future is going to be. Let's make investments in it now, which I think is uh, perhaps fairly clever. Well, look, we've seen these, you know, these regulatory driven mandates before, right? You know, <laughs> California's had a couple of them, you know, that's why the GM EV1 was ever made, right? Because it was a, everybody thought there was going to be an EV mandate, right? In California that everybody was serious about. Then when the day came and nobody had EVs and nobody wanted EVs, uh, guess what, guys? We we really can't help you there, right? And so that all kind of went away. So, uh, you know, I, I think, you, you know, we've seen time and again, these attempts to kind of regulate the market, you know, and regulate demand, uh, unless you've got some other drivers there for consumers. And, and even then, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't always work. Uh, you know, so, yeah, they say, oh, by 2035, we're going to ban this. And, you know, Europe's already talked about, you know, several of the major, uh, you know, cities have said, oh, we're going to do the same thing. No more IC after 2025, I think London and a few others. O okay. But, you know, when, when that day comes, we've seen time and again, you know, every all the other industries who are affected, they say, guys, we can't do it. We can't can't make this happen. And so what happens? It doesn't become a thing, you know. Uh, so I, I, I really look at that stuff with a, you know, with a fairly jaundiced eye. I mean, it, it's got to be such an integrated kind of a policy throughout your entire economy. Uh, and, and to make those things sort of stick and last for like the next 10 years, I don't know, you know. Hey, th th there's plenty more to talk on this, but we got to take a quick commercial break right now and give a shout out to our good sponsor, Bridgestone. All right, we're back talking all things automotive. Should we so, continue so, that so, discussion or you got other things, Gary, right? Well, we, we, we had other things to talk about here. And, and so, you know, we, we, we've talked about these issues right along. Um, 
but let's let's wrap up one aspect of it that John um, Tesla was hoping that it was going to be on the S and P five hundred, and it didn't make it. <laughs> so so what do you see going on there? Well, yeah, it, it, look. I, I'm not an investment expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I'll tell you what I've read and talked to other people about is that would have been a big deal if Tesla had made it uh, onto that index because many investment firms and pension plans and the like invest in that index. And it means that you've got to buy, you know, shares in all the the stocks that that form that index. So potentially this could have been creating a lot of demand for Tesla stock. But I think what the S&P looked at and said was, Yowza, this company is so overvalued, you know, we don't want to include it in the uh in the index and it you know, Tesla has a good day and it 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 sends the index soaring and some news comes out and the the, the stock takes a nosedive and it too much vol volatility for the index and I think that's probably why they decided not to include it. Yeah, I thought it was funny that Etsy made it, but Tesla didn't. I mean, it's uh, what a strange world this is. Um, and and staying with this electric thing, and in the um, seems to be becoming a theme of the show. Um, so today, Ford proudly announced that it is spending seven hundred million dollars at the Rouge Complex to build a facility to build the electric F one fifty. Um, you know, you're talking, John, about about companies thinking about you know spinning off the value um, of of uh, you know an electric brand, as it were. Ford seems to be taking the opposite tack. They seem to be saying, you know what, we're going to have the the Mustang Mach E electric, and we're going to have the F one fifty electric, and it's going to be a Ford. Yeah, what do you guys think? Uh, yeah, I I think you're spot on, Gary. They're not, you know even talking about a potential spinoff. They they want the whole Ford Motor Company to benefit from this, not just some spinoff. Well, the F-150 is the franchise there, right? I mean, you know, they, uh, uh, you know, I, I, and when you mentioned earlier, Gary, about GM and the Badger, you know, and, oh, let's have a different brand. At, uh, you know, the, it, it, you got to be careful, I think, with that, because if you, you know, either you say to yourself, the F-150 is now and forever going to be an internal combustion thing, right? You know, or you leave room to be able to transition it into the, you know, the kind of electric future that everybody, we just talked about this too, that everybody thinks is going to be there, you know, 10 or 15 years or however many years from now. So, you know, do you want to take the risk of separating that very iconic brand that you've built up now with an F-150 or a Mustang or whatever, and more or less putting a wall up between that and ele the electrification future, you know? And I think it's, you know, you're seeing Ford is saying, these are our, you know, they even say these are our icons, right? You know, this is, this is where, you know, this is what people know us for. And so whether it's internal combustion now and electric, you know, fully electric, 10 years from now or three years from now or whatever, you know, I, I think they feel like they have to be able to blend the, you know, and, and bring it along as, as time goes on so that at some point, you know, 10 years from now, you know, you don't have to even say electric F-150 anymore because they're all electrics, you know. Uh, I, so that's what I wonder about, you know, with when, when you start to look at Rivian in that whole equation, you know, with their relationship with Ford, uh, you know, G the GM and Nikola deal, uh, you know, when you come down to, you know, branding things for the automotive market, where do they really see all that stuff going? You know, uh, you know, for GM, the trucks are, are very much their, their uh, huge profit centers, uh, you know, as well you don't really want to separate separate those from whatever the potential is for electrification, I think 10 years from now. So, uh, you know, they're, they're just saying whatever an F-150 is now and whatever it's going to be, that's what we're sticking with, I think, you know? 
Yeah, it was interesting that they, they so so Ford hired the Boston Consulting Group to make a determination of how important not only Ford is to the U.S. economy, but how important the F-150 is to the U.S. economy. And they calculated that the F-Series generated $42 billion contributing to GDP, which, which, is, mm-hmm. which is bigger than McDonald's, Coca-Cola, and Starbucks, which I think is an, ast- an astonishing number. Yeah, you know, look at what Ford's doing today. They they launched this whole new advertising campaign. I, I think the tagline is "Built for America," and I, I'm intrigued by this. Ford is really branding mm. its country, or it, it its its brand name, as, as being you know internal to the fabric of the United States. And what's very interesting about the ads that they've created is I don't care if you're a you know, far right winger or a far left winger, this ad's going to appeal to you. It, it, it has a way of uh, really appealing to people on both sides of the spectrum. And I, I think what the company is doing is looking at the fact that people like to buy products in a company that they like and respect. So it's, it's not just the product itself, it's the company that stands behind it. And Ford is clearly... Uh, positioning itself as, you know, an important part of the American fabric. It's the kind of company that steps up to help society when it needs it, like with the ventilators and the masks and all that stuff for the pandemic and the like. And I actually found that interesting, as interesting, maybe more interesting than the fact that it's going to build a little sideline building to Mm. to be able to assemble electric pickups. So so what makes... Besides the fact that there is a family name, what makes Ford any different in that than General Motors? Well, you you got to market that fact. You've got to present these ideas to the public. General Motors does zero advertising as General Motors. It's only its brands. In fact, I've run into people in the past, not any time recently, who were amazed to learn that Cadillac was part of General Motors. <laughs> That's how disassociated the public is with General Motors and, and what its public brands are. Whereas Ford, and like other companies, Toyota or Honda or whatever, the company's name is the brand. There is no General Motors brand that you can go out and buy. You can buy their different, you know, Chevrolet and Cadillac and et cetera. So Ford has this advantage of, the brand of the company is what's the, the brand on the vehicles, not counting Lincoln for the moment. But it's it's trying to brand the company in a way that the American public, in this case, goes, dang, I like that company. And like I said, it doesn't matter if you're on the left or the right. You're going to look at those ads and you're going to go, dang, that is a great company. All right. So, so two points on that, John. Okay. Number one, remember that when Saturn Corporation first came out and ended up winning all kinds of awards and accolades for customer service and satisfaction. And, and even though the vehicles were mediocre, I mean, they were, they were hailed that, that one of the, one of the rationalizations was we want to make this brand completely separate from General Motors. Okay. And to the extent that they followed that plan, <laughs> they were highly successful. Then remember approximately about the same time, um, and I think Ron Zarella may have come up with this idea. Remember that they put these little chiclet sized GM badges right. on that was, every that was Bob single... Lutz's idea. Was it Bob um, Lutz's idea? Yeah, absolutely. Well, GM's yeah. always had an identity crisis, right? You know, I mean, that just the nature of what it is, it was a formation of brands that were, you know, and look, John, back in the day, you guys, you know, they, these, these, divisions when there were divisions at GM they competed against one another right you know and and the whole thing was kind of insane really you know and I, I don't think they've ever really truly been able to to come to grips with you know how do you treat this company in the you know the public facing part of this company what should it be right uh you know it, it, it's it's 
Uh, here's the other thing I'll say about the Ford thing. You see things pop up like this very strange thing. You know, I don't want to say it's a strange thing necessarily, but you see things pop up like this in election years too, right? You know, and, and it's an election year. There's a lot of polarization right now about, you know, what's American, what really isn't American, you know, all that sort of stuff. And so I, I don't think it's a coincidence that this is coming up just a couple of months before the election too. Right? <laughs> Great point, Bill. <laughs> You know, and I thought it was interesting also is is that so every year the Kogad School of Business has a Made in America Auto Index, and the number one vehicle is the Ford Ranger. Hmm. Interesting, huh? Yeah, very much so. You you cut out for just a second there, Gary. You said the highest content, highest American content. Yes, was is is the Ranger? The Ranger, okay. yeah. Yeah. Well, well we all it, know, too, that uh, the Honda Accord and the Toyota Camry score right. very high on that list, too. Yeah, yeah. Ex except for the fact that I thought was very interesting is, is that so, in you know, in, ter in, in terms of the top 10, um, the at number seven, the Acura TLX, Honda Passport, Honda Ridgeline, Honda Odyssey, and it ties with the Camaro with a manual and the Cadillac XT5 and XT6 and the GMC Acadia. And what I find to be a little disingenuous about the way these guys calculate it is that basically they give you more points if your headquarters happens yeah. to be in the United States. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, right. And, yeah, we, uh, look, we see this every year come up, you know, the you, you can play this game. Center for Automotive Research has an entirely different metric, I think, that, you know, they, they mm -hmm. would – they would tell you that if they would generate the same list, Gary, I think it wouldn't be, you know, ordered in anything like that fashion. Well, I mean, maybe the the top ones would still be somewhere close to the top or whatever. But, right. uh, but you know, John, this is what I was going to mention to you, too, about this uh, thing of Ford's, this new ad campaign tying themselves to, you know, America. OK, you leave yourself wide open for somebody to start doing these calculations of, you know, how American are is a Ford car versus somebody else's. Right. You know, and you may not want to know that answer. <laughs> so um, on, on a completely different subject. Um, so this this past Monday, BP came out with uh a, a study of the way where it sees energy going. And they said that demand for oil may have peaked last year. And they came out with three scenarios. And so they were looking at, um, you know, consequences Sorry. that would, that would, you know, drive changes in, in oil demand. And it goes out through 2050, but in all cases, it still goes back to 2019 being basically the greatest demand, um, you know, the the peak. Um, John, w w what do you think about this? Is it, you know, I mean, well, you look, all this does is confirm a study that uh, Bloomberg News Energy Finance came out with two or three years ago, that was predicting exactly what BP is saying. In fact, BNEF, the the Bloomberg guys are saying that by 2025, there is going to be a global oil glut. There kind of already is already, but COVID's got a lot to do with that and, and the like. But what they're saying is vehicles get more efficient as more hybrids, plug-ins, and BEVs come into the market. They're, we're we're going to be a wash in oil. And they also predict, uh, at least they, three years ago, they were predicting a collapse in the price of oil. Well, we've already seen the collapse. You know, uh, what's gas in the U.S. going for right now? I, I think regular is about $2.30. I think the price of a barrel is in the low $40 range. I mean, remember, if you go back to 2011, 2012, everybody was sure that at this point in time, oil was going to be $150 a barrel, if not $200 a barrel. So anyway, long way short of saying, I think uh, Bloomberg Energy Finance uh, predicted this several years ago. This sort of, Bill, this sort of goes to what you were saying about how, you know, 10 years from now, they just may be all electric vehicles and we just don't pay any attention to it. It's just, yeah, that's just how it is. Uh, I don't know. It's it's really difficult to, to, to say with any certainty how this, 
you know, whole transition is, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I'm not surprised to see them saying this now, because as we all know, over the last six months, individual travel has has been cut by, you know, an enormous amount. Right. You know, just an enormous amount. And so, uh, you know, I think what they're saying is, you know, I think the world has figured out that, you know, a lot of, of personal travel, a lot of business travel doesn't really have to happen anymore. Right. You know, and, and you're going to see that ripple through the world economies everywhere. You know, as, as somebody says, hey, you know, we used to send our salespeople out, you know, all over the countryside all the time to, you know, to make sales visits and talk to people and, you know, that sort of thing. And they found out that a lot of that business can be done just as effectively and and in some ways maybe more effectively by not doing that right not getting on planes and not you know doing all this travel that that in effect was uh you know in some ways not e efficient you, you know it was habit and it was uh you know, it was just sort of ritual, really, almost. And so I, I'm not surprised, I guess, to see, you know, a major energy company saying, well, you know, we think a lot of these rituals are probably going to come under a higher scrutiny now, even after COVID is solved, if you want to call it that. And uh, uh, we think a lot of unnecessary or inefficient travel is, uh, you know, it's just not going to happen, you know. All right, so I want to wrap this all up with with a quote here, okay? And and this is yeah. a this is a quote from Mary Barra. Quote: We believe strongly in our EV future, and not just for vehicles. The strength and flexibility of our Ultium battery systems open the doors for many use cases, including aerial mobility, which represents a natural next step in a zero emissions vision. John, now I know that you've been enthusiastic about drones and things like that. Um, okay, is 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 Mary just saying something to affect the stock of General Motors, or do you think this is the real thing? Oh, I'll bet they're looking into it. I, I thought that was such a fascinating throwaway line of of Mary's, and you're absolutely absolutely right. I, I think we did our first show on passenger drones in 2017. So yeah, uh, I'm a big proponent of it. I believe it's going to happen at uh, not this year's, but last year's consumer electronic show, CES in Las Vegas, Bell, Bell Helicopter absolutely stole the show when they showed their seven passenger drone. And uh, there is a uh, a lot of opportunity to leverage automotive technology in these things because they're going to be electric, either pure battery electric or hybrid electric. They're going to be autonomous at some point. So whether it's LIDAR or sonar or 3D stereo cameras and all the software to run that, uh, the hybrid systems and the like, there is huge opportunity and whether it's GM's Ultium batteries or it's a uh, hydrogen fuel cell, what they call Hydrotech, and it's uh, autonomous technology developed with crews, it's a natural for GM to look at this. And remember, they're, they're almost late to the parley, party. Geely, or Geely, I guess, as it's properly pronounced, already bought a drone company. Daimler already bought a drone mm -hmm. company. Denso announced a year ago or longer that it's getting into this business too because it sees that it's got all the parts and components they're going to need. So yeah, I, I take what Mary said very seriously. At CES last year, along with all the other, uh, Hyundai was tied up in the uh, it w with a you know urban air transport uh, concept too. Uh, you know where they clearly think that there's there's something there. You, you know and and uh, yeah, I don't think it'll be long before you at least see some kind of prototype service going somewhere, you know, that, that uh, is at least trying this out, you know, just to see what happens, if nothing else. Uh, I don't know if I want to be the first passenger on one of those <laughs> things or not, but, but uh, you know, look, it's, it's absolutely going to happen. All right. See, see, but I, I so I, I'll throw cold water on both of you guys. Okay. Now, do you remember that, you know, back in the seventies when, it was it was helicopter service 
from the tops of New York high rises that would take you to LaGuardia or would take you to JFK. Not us, of course, because we didn't have the money for that, right? Because we would have to take a bus or a train or what, what have you. And, and I just wonder whether this isn't much of the same thing, that it's just like, okay, um, you know, we all know autonomous cars are going to be unaffordable for individuals for many years. And it seems to me that flying autonomous vehicles will be exponentially more expensive and therefore it, it just becomes eh, not a big deal. Tell me why I'm wrong. Well, well I, I wouldn't necessarily say you're not. I, I just, I, I think a technology has come a long way since the helicopters off of uh, New York skyscrapers, you know, was, was being proposed because of the, you know, really the, I think the primary problem with that and John, maybe, you know, correct me on this, but uh, you know, one of the primary problems was, is just the cost of it was just still outlandish. And, you know, you're running a helicopter, you know, everyone knows helicopters are incredibly high, you know, per hour uh, devices to run, you know, and I think part of at least part of the cell with the autonomous EV tall sort of uh, model business model is, is that, wow, you're going to put these pretty cheap electric motors in. It's going to be no pilot. You don't have to have some skilled professional flying the thing, you know, all that, I, you know, that that the cost per mile is something that, that more maybe actual regular people might be able to use. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with what Bill said. Uh, number one today, congestion is far, far worse mm -hmm. than it was 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And so there are people who have got to get to places and they'll be willing to pay for it or their company will. Right. And secondly, to, to Bill's point, helicopters are incredibly complicated machines. I mean, the transmission and the <laughs> blade arrangement on a helicopter right. is, is a real Rube Goldberg kind of contrivance. And, and they're very difficult to fly. They take a lot of training. Uh, not so with electric drones. Very easy to do, very easy to fly, very easy to maintain, a whole lot quieter. They're still noisy, but a whole lot quieter than helicopters. So I'm, I'm not going to say they're going to succeed, Gary, but I think there's a much more compelling case for them today than there were for helicopters 30 or 40 years ago. Particularly in the really, really highly congested markets where there are moneyed people around, you know, I, every time I go to Washington, D.C., and it's been a while now, of course, like it has for all of us, but I'm astonished at how many helicopters are flying around constantly, right? You know, it's because you can't get anywhere there anymore, and you've got VIPs, you know, of government people got to get from one side of town to the other bang you know they're getting in helicopters san francisco you know places like that where you know there's just such a you know high degree of congestion uh and and the proportion of moneyed people in those markets is is high look this uh, you know, it could happen I, I think it could happen all right two points on that and then we'll wrap the show up okay Number one is, is Bill, what, what you're simply suggesting is that we move the congestion up above the well, yeah, surface. It's not going to do anything for congestion, actually, I think. You're right. I mean, that's not going to solve the congestion problem. No. Okay. And then number two, John, when I can go from here to the <laughs> studio autonomously on the ground, then I'll begin to come around to your way of thinking. But I don't know that that's going to be <laughs> happening anytime soon, so... That's that's my final word. That's kind of how okay. I feel about it too. I don't want to be the first passenger in them. <laughs> that, that's... Real good, you guys. Hey, Bill, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks. Good to it's have always you a pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. Real good. And Gary, good seeing you, and we'll do good it again next week. All right. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Thanks, everybody, for having Thank tuned you. in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.